News tonight on the Voice of America. Hello, welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Douglas Simpuga, and here's what's coming up. There's no clear path to having any of these abusers stop being in power that has led them to the ability to conduct the abuses. That was Human Rights Watch Washington Deputy Director Nicole Weldsham on the latest U.S. State Department report on human rights abuses around the globe. Also, Nigeria media report 21 people were killed in Saturday's elections while police rescued 17 kidnapped election officials. And several hundred supporters of Tunisia President Kais Saeed rallied in support of his government. All this and more coming up on African News Tonight. In its annual report today on human rights practices, the U.S. State Department looked at at violations and abuses in 198 countries and territories based on what the U.S. calls credible reports in 2022. The report is required to be submitted to Congress each year. The State Department highlighted what it calls massive, massive deaths and destruction during Russia's war against Ukraine, accusing Russian forces of committing war crimes and other atrocities. It also reports cases of abuse and violations in Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Sudan. Human Rights Watch Washington Deputy Director Nicole Weldersham tells VOA's Carl Van Dam that while the report is thorough, the U.S. has not done enough to follow up on cases of rights abuses with action, especially regarding the military rulers in Sudan, who staged a coup in October 2021. They have worked out an agreement that we're going to see the details of very soon that keep them in power. And it puts them on a transitional track to civilian leadership that, call me a cynic, but I've worked on Sudan for over 20 years. That is going to, like, the devil will be in the time in the details they're only committing themselves to transitioning themselves out of power. Now, they transitioned once out of power, and then they took it back in a coup in 2021. So I, I, I can't see, there's no clear path to having any of these abusers stop being in power that has led them to the ability to conduct the abuses. There's, no, there's all impunity across the board in Ethiopia, in Sudan. South Sudan has worked so effectively to basically dissolve something they agreed to, the hybrid court on war crimes, to hold themselves accountable and to stop the, the cycle of impunity. And so all they want to talk about is reconciliation while the, the violent abuses continue and those that oversaw the abuses in the South Sudanese government still stay in, stay in power. And they talk kind of illustratively about an election where they'll also transition to civilian power. And everybody just keeps these things on the horizon. And we're setting up the same path for Sudan, you commit now to having a transition to civilian elections, sorry, civilian government through elections at some point, some arbitrary date in the future, and you continue with these abuses and impunity and control over the economy and everything else. What would uh, Human Rights Watch like to see happen in those in those kinds of incidences with South Sudan, Sudan, Ethiopia? The State Department Human Rights Report that was released released today gives the U.S. government yet another chance to say, we know what's happening and we will hold those that do these grave human rights abuses and atrocity crimes accountable in our policy. So there's a whole variety of tools that they can do that. They can do that with sanctioning individuals. They can put travel uh, restrictions on individuals. They can freeze bank accounts. If any of these individuals that are committing crimes hold their money in U.S. dollars anywhere, uh, they can um keep uh, certain UN mechanisms and do the diplomatic spade work that we create a diplomatic coalition that keeps these UN mechanisms that monitor human rights like in Ethiopia and elsewhere in place. So we continue to expose the truth and the US government's at the, at the forefront of that. There's things that they can do with the Se- their permanent member of the Security Council. They can look at the UN levers and tools and they can really marriage uh, and, and institutionalize the information they know and the abuses that they're document abuses they are documenting by the people that they're working with into their regional policies and their foreign policies on these countries. That was uh, that's Nicole Weldersham, Human Rights Watch, Washington Deputy Director and African expert. She was speaking with my colleague Carol Van Dam. <laughs> Thank you.
Election observers and rights activists in Nigeria say Saturday's gubernatorial elections were marred by widespread violence and voter suppression, especially in Lagos. Nigerian media report 21 people were killed and scores injured, while police rescued 17 election officials kidnapped in the southeast Imo state. Despite glitches and delays, Nigeria's Minister of Information called it the most credible election in two decades. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja, Nigeria. So far, Nigeria's Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has declared results for 12 states, including the economic hub of Lagos, where incumbent Governor Babajide Sanwolu of the ruling party was re-elected. But observers say Saturday's elections were characterized by widespread violence, voter suppression and intimidation. Local media reported that 21 people were killed and scores injured across the country. In Imo State, police rescued 17 INEX staffers abducted by gunmen on the morning of the elections as they were heading to their polling units. Rights group Amnesty International condemned the violence. Aminu Hayatu is Amnesty International's conflict researcher. There are pockets of violence, uh, you know, and uh, the prevention of people. Uh, to make their choices in the ballot, you know, disrupting uh, electoral processes, you know, and campaign of calumny uh, and uh, the the employment of thugs. We strong con- uh, we, we strongly condemn uh, such uh, human rights violations. Amnesty International said social media was used to incite tribal hatred and ethnic slurs and urged social media companies like Twitter, Meta and WhatsApp to improve their screening out of hateful content. There were also issues of staff delays and technical difficulties during Saturday's polls. But Nigeria's information minister, Lai Mohammed, who voted in his hometown in southwest Kwara State, said the election was one of the most credible in Nigeria's recent history. Idayat Hassan, director at the Center for Democracy and Development, disagrees and says the trend is worrying. The likelihood of post-election violence are, in, uh, are high, but how widespread is what we do not know. And Considering this is a projection, the response of the state is what we should actually be looking up to. How will the Nigerian state be able to timely expect that they need any form of insecurity challenges in the board without, with the minimum use of force? Kano state authorities have imposed a dusk-to-dawn curfew in anticipation of unrest as more results are announced. Amnesty International wants authorities to identify and punish promoters of election violence. Such are violations against uh, the international human rights law, which Nigeria is signatory to. And we are calling on government, uh, you know, to investigate and fish out uh, the, 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 those who are behind uh, such human rights violations, uh, irrespective of who, who they are. Last month, observers said the presidential election in which the ruling party's Bola Ahmed Tunubu was declared the winner lacked transparency and didn't meet the expectations of most citizens. Experts say there's heightened tension in many states, including Adamawa State, where incumbent Governor Amadou Fintiri of the People's Democratic Party and Senator Aishatu Ahmed Benani of the All Progressives Congress are locked in a tough race. Ahmed Benani is the first woman with a realistic chance of being elected governor in Nigeria. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. <music> French, French journalist Olivier Dubois and American aid worker Jeffrey Wood have been released after being kidnapped by jihadists, jihadists in the Sahel. Dubois spent two years in captivity and Wood six as Anika Hamashlog reports from Dakar, Senegal. The two men were released Monday and are now in safe hands in Niger's capital, Niamey, according to media reports. Dubois was kidnapped on April 8, 2021, in Mali's northern Gao region by the Group for the Support of Islam and Muslims, or JNIM, a coalition of jihadist insurgent groups active in the Sahel. He was there to interview a jihadist leader when he was abducted. 
In a video posted to Twitter, he appeared to be in good condition and in good spirits. He told reporters he was tired but felt fine. It's huge for me to be here, to be free, he says. I'd like to acknowledge Niger and their expertise with this sensitive mission, and to France as well, to everyone that allowed me to be here today. American aid worker Jeffrey Woodkey has also been released after six and a half years in captivity. Woodkey was kidnapped in October 2016 from his home in Abalak, Niger, and is believed to have been taken to Mali. Niger's interior minister said Nigerian authorities secured his release from JNIM, which is active throughout West Africa and the Sahel. Via Twitter, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said he was gratified and relieved over Woodkey's liberation and thanked Niger for its help in securing his release. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Niger last Thursday. Annika Hammerschlag for VOA News, Dakar, Senegal. Police fired tear gas today at opposition supporters in Nairobi who are protesting against President William Ruto, the government, and the high cost of living. Opposition leader Raylo Dinga called for the protests. For more on the protest, I reached uh, Haman Manyora, a political analyst and professor at the University of Nairobi. The protest in Kenya is regrettable. It's a sunny day, and uh, this sort of thing interferes with the peace in the country. It does interfere with business and uh, with the lives of citizens, interrupts many things. Children who are going to school today after mid-term break. It is something that must be avoided at all costs. It's not good for the country. And apart from Kenya, there have been protests across the continent in Tunisia and South Africa, and some had been planned in Senegal. Are Africans uh, finding their voice, or as you say, is disruptive? These are disruptive things, and African leaders must learn that we are in the 21st century. We live in a, in a century and times when leadership is negotiated, when you must dialogue with your people, have a conversation as a people, whenever issues arise, and indeed there will always be issues, leaders must learn to sit down with their opponents in the manner admirably shown by President Samia Suluo Tanzania, who has invited the opposition in a series of meetings to sort out the problems facing the country and find a way of dealing with Tanzanian problems. African leaders must go in that direction. He's just camping and saying, I cannot talk to anybody. I am the president or I'm the opposition leader. I must have my way. This, it, it, it has no room for the 21st. Professor, protests and demonstrations uh, haven't been tolerated in the past. And even when they are, not uh, much has been gotten from them, apart from the Arab Spring. Uh, they have not uh, borne results. Do you think uh, this time across the continent, the, the governments will respond to the people's demands? I don't think that is true of Kenya. A lot of what we have achieved in this country has been achieved through the struggle. People have been in the trenches from the 80s and 90s during the second liberation. Almost everything we have today in terms of human rights, democracy, good governance, and the little development that we have achieved surely has been achieved through struggle, through demonstrations, through all manner of pushing, and for us, really, you cannot say it has not borne results. For Kenya, no. For Kenya, demonstrations, uh, mass action, actually, these sort of things have uh, produced results. I also think, even this one, if you are in a room today, as a leader of the Niger world, this is not the sort of thing you can ignore if you are government. It's not possible. It's not possible because the disruptions are mass, the turnouts, so the people facing the police, the defiance, really turning Nairobi into a ghost town or a war zone, alternating between a ghost town with no people into a war zone. I don't think any president would be proud to sit in the state house or the White House or whatever you call your, your, your residence for the president. 